welcome Facebook Live. I'm sorry, our other board members are out still working today and commuting. So welcome to FasterCon. Um, it is Philippine American History Month this month, History, not Heritage Month. And we're welcoming folks from ALA, the Asian Leaders Alliance, and Lead Filipino. Uh, we'll be talking about anti-Asian violence, as well as uh, Angela Kinto and his death last year, who was an inspiring game designer. Uh, he was kneeled on the way that George Floyd was kneeled on, um, and he is almost like never talked about. So we'll definitely be talking about him and a lot of the areas in which um, community safety protocols are being built by, you know, different community organizations, and we need to learn more about that. Um, for our schedule today, we have, outside of an overview of Faster, um, my performance, which is going to be uh, releasing, for, at least for me, I'm releasing a book, um, a, a chapbook of poetry over the last 10 years on blockchain, uh, so that's a, there's a preview for that, and Jimmy says, sending to everyone. Okay. Um, we have uh, Asian Leaders Alliance, uh, Jimmy Hua, uh, who founded it, Brian Pang and Jaya, uh, speaking on behalf of ALA, who also serve on the leadership team. Uh, Lead Filipinos Executive Director, Dr. Jell Cortez, will be speaking as well about the Justice for Angela Kinto campaign. Um, and Charity, who is our uh, National Board Secretary, Charity Nicholas, uh, she just flew in from Oakland, uh, from Hawaii. Uh, she'll be talking briefly about her roommate, Grace Ascension, uh, who unfortunately was killed in, 19, in the 1990s uh, at UC Berkeley at Cal. So as we talk about uh, anti-Asian hate, this is not something that is new in our community. It's something that uh, has happened in the past, and it's really important uh, for us to really acknowledge our history around that. Um, quickly about FASTER. Uh, FASTER is a national 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit, um, really dedicated to the values towards justice, diversity, equity, inclusion, equality. Many people have different acronyms with the E. Uh, you can read more about us um, on our brochure and deck. We'll drop these links in the chat chat for people to view at the end of today's um, webinar. And really quickly on our history, um, originally when I founded FASTER, uh, it was called Filipino Americans in Silicon Valley Tech. Um, in trying to be inclusive outside of the San Francisco Bay Area and of you know, other fields that you know, cross over into creative, entertainment, uh, games, media, uh, we emphasize the A in STEAM. So it's Filipino Americans in STEAM, not STEM. Um, we're very particular about that. Some of the leading designers in our community, including Dino Ignacio from Oculus. Um, we have a huge set of panelists tomorrow that are doing amazing things at Adobe, Netflix, and Marvel. Um, they're leading designers in this field, you know, in some of the biggest uh, technology platforms. And so we definitely want to be inclusive and acknowledge that. And I just want folks to shout out the chat uh, where you're from. Now, you can mention, at least for me, I am from Fremont, California, and I am on Ohlone land. So Ohlone, the tribe actually, so it's Coyote Hills, it's two miles from my house and Facebook Newark. So if people want to mention in the chat where they are and what spaces those are on, that, that would be great. Um, for us personally at FASTER, you know, it's really important for us as a Filipino American community to acknowledge um, Indigenous Peoples Day, Indigenous sovereignty. And if you don't know, you know, the land that you're on, you know, I would encourage you to look at the Native Americans who had settled there before. Lastly, I'm going to ask for a quick moment of silence just for folks who had uh, experienced loss during COVID-19. You know, I know a lot of us are going back into normalcy, but many uh, victims of COVID-19, I would say, especially Filipino Americans on the front lines, nurses in particular that are you know, part of almost every Filipino American family um, have passed on during this pandemic. Um, anyone that's been a victim of a hate crime, um, as well as, you know, if I think about Black Lives Matter and police brutality, you know, it goes beyond just two, one or two incidents. It's, it's something that's been happening for a long time. So with that, I'm going to give ourselves a pause. Thank you. And for the rest of FasterCon, this is just a brief overview of the schedule. So today we're talking all about the issues. And tomorrow, our main conference, um, we'll be highlighting trailblazers all over the map. So from creative design, arts, um, we'll have the first panel that we're having on artificial intelligence, AI, uh, data science, and design. So a lot of our designers uh, that code, um, our engineers that design and how we think about machine intelligence, 
uh, from companies like Adobe and different agencies. And then on a Sunday, we have a big treat. Um, we have a reverend who's also a professor um, in Rhode Island at Providence College who developed a COVID-19 uh, yeast-based vaccine specifically for the Philippines. Uh, he'll be sharing remarks along with uh, UC Merced's founding faculty member, uh, Professor Jennifer Manilai, um, who is the faculty department chair of biology. And lastly, oh, I do want to mention before plugging in ALA, uh, Charity Nicholas is also, uh, who I mentioned on our board, is one of the leading and highest ranking women of color in the health tech and safety field. So she's actually in charge of setting a lot of safety standards and protocols related to COVID-19 tech company reopening. So as we talk about um, health and safety and different campaigns um, like Phil Pro Philippine Young Leaders Program, which you know is a part of our COVID-19 panel. Um, we'll also be talking about um, healthcare and safety. And with that being said, if you uh, still have folks that want to register that missed our Eventbrite link, uh, these are the links to uh, each specific day's event. And again, we'll post this in the chat uh, shortly after uh, I complete this part of the webinar so that folks can register. Uh, FASTER is also, you know, in terms of our history, even though we had started off um, as an organization focused on education, we've expanded to really focusing on professional development. Uh, we are a member of ALA, Asian Leaders Alliance, uh, myself and Charity are part of that, uh, and we're trying to get more uh, Filipino uh, American tech company employee resource groups or ERGs to join, so please consider joining uh, ALA. Uh, that's us at Cuba Binds at Netflix a couple of years ago. There's Anne Aaron right in the middle, who is the uh, uh, director of encoding technologies um, at, at, at Netflix. So she's probably one of the highest ranking uh, pen eyes in engineering. And lastly, our last component of Faster is Faster Fresh. So having a space in which we can support our high tech uh, startup entrepreneurs and investors. Um, we're still working on a matching program. Uh, to the right is uh, some of our founders who uh, were alumni of the Seed Accelerator program, Y Combinator. And again, we'll drop all the links in the chat. There's so many different ways you can join. Faster really is that safe space so that anytime, any place in the life cycle, being a self-identified Filipino American, you can find your place in tech. Uh, we are all over social, so you can join us on you know, any of our different channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. We'll be relaunching our Discord and uh, Slack channels. Um, just go to fasterstream.org. Uh, email us and quickly about myself. Um, so I work in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space. Uh, so some of these links don't work unless you have Brave and there's like an integration with Handshake. If you want to ask me questions about that later, uh, please let me know. But uh, you can find me at all things Aaron Jerry. Um, I previously worked in the augmented and virtual reality space and have a book on the subject. Um, a lot of my family's worked in uh, biotech for over 30 years, both my parents do. Um, my family's all over the map in tech, whether, you know, someone who founded a company and invested in a company worked, you know, on the assembly line, um, being born and raised here in Silicon Valley um, is a huge privilege um, to be connected to, you know, the, really the center for innovation here. And my parents are from um, particularly Pampanga, San Fernando, and my dad is from uh, Manila. And about my path, I won't go through all of this, but I, I spent about five years in civic engagement. And uh, my previous boss, our last for my last electoral campaign, was a former Deputy US Secretary of Commerce, uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, who most recently is known the, as the co-chair of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Again, we're a 501c3 um, nonprofit, uh, we're nonpartisan. Uh, this was just a part of my background in history, but um, previously working uh, in that, uh, space, you know, is trying to identify all of the different Filipino American leaders in tech, and there weren't very many that I could point that to that were executives that could donate at the executive level for presidential races. Uh, and in that process, I joined Stack Silicon Valley Science Technology Engineering, or was it Science Technology Advisory Council, which really focuses on angel investment in the Philippines. Um, it was an R&D group started by Dada Bada Tao, who is one of the two people of color in Homebrew Computer Club with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Their R&D group created a lot of angel and venture capital investment there, but a lot of the, the work had been focused primarily in the Philippines. There wasn't anything here in the U.S., and so I founded Faster 
um, you know, many years ago. And since then, it's definitely grown. Uh, it traversed many spaces, VR, AI, and most recently now in blockchain. So uh, you can find my book at creatingarvr.com and I will be dropping a poetry book and NFT on my birthday that's to come. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna actually pull up really quickly on this poem. I don't wanna have to stop share. Let's see. Can folks still see my screen? And oh, Jell Cortez is back by the way. Yes. Cool. So I'm actually gonna turn my video now. It'd be great if people could turn the video. I just realized I was like presenting this whole time. Um, so this is titled Asian American Woman Superhero. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Well, certainly for an Asian American woman, it would not be invisibility. She's already got that on lock. They ask her who she is. Sometimes she doesn't have a name or people forget us, like Atlanta Sun Chung Park, age 74, Hyung Jung Grant, age 51, Sun Cha Kim, age 69, Young Yu, age 63, Delena Ashley Wan, age 33, Xiao Jitan, age 49, Dao Yufeng, age 44. If we are lucky, names like Ali Wong, Margaret Cho, Mindy Cowling, Christiane Maguchi, Michelle Kwan, Cheryl Burke roll off our tongues. And if they had a daughter, we'd rave about how funny and radical and beautiful she would be, famous and graceful. Asian American woman superhero. She is that everyday woman whose scars go unseen by Hollywood paparazzi in Silicon Valley social media posts. She, she is everyone's nanai. Mom, Lola, grandma, auntie, ate, big sister, adding, little sister, friend, homegirl, BFF, these women who do so much for us, birth us, feed and nourish us with the tastes of home that gives our souls depth, organize us and make us awake to the world's harsh realities and joys. She often goes unsung, unnamed and underappreciated. So here I sing praise for the women who often get no thanks. Thanks to these women who tell us when they are being Shady and should not date that two-timing guy who tell us that we look fat in a dress. She cares as that everyday essential worker, nurse, doctor on the front line. If y'all haven't heard it before, maraming salama, maybe many, many thanks to every single one of you who has risked their lives during COVID-19. There will never be enough utterances of gratitude to do you justice. She is that homegirl voice that tells us we drank a little too much and pulls our hair back when we were drunk and vomiting. But for real, for me, more intimately in my family, it's indigenous quilt work of turquoise and purple, blue triangles in the shape of a 16-dimensional tesseract, designs passed down generations from my Lola that I trace as a map, trace back toward pre-colonial times. Looks like futuristic fabric adorning mar so soldiers in Marvel movies like Anthony Francisco dressing Black Panther, women warriors. These designs remind me that words like fashion forward are no stranger to the Filipina. We are beyond New York City catwalks, our Asian women's sports style like no other, flaunting that swagger of confidence from the street. She is that clever tech CEO who does work for the community, that Michelle Fan makeup artist on YouTube making us look also damn fine, while also still telling us to invest in ourselves, private Bitcoin women mafia strategizing decentralizing finance, giving people money back away from paying pseudonyms or laptop radio and cipher penai. She's strong like Anne Hulatan, Diana Inasanta, who packs the punch as tight as Manny or kick ass as hard as Bruce Lee. We ask her how does she do it all of the time? Those moms mothering four kids, setting health and safety standards like Charity Nicholas during COVID-19 so we don't get sick and stay six feet apart. This is for the women who hold it down in heels or in kicks, that DJ scratching behind turntables and a hat that is easy to miss, that B-girl on the dance floor doing everything but the worm. She is straight, she is queer, comes off calm and collected even behind a bullhorn rallying the people, centered always telling us how it is, unapologetic, calling out injustice. She is that scholar activist, uh, Professora, Alison Tintiago Cobales, Robin Rodriguez, historian Don Mabalan, DJ Cutting Candy, and holding it down for community, still there after everyone has left the party, and she is cleaning up, curator and creator of our culture. She is that young activist delivering food for the elders during COVID-19, young mom taking care of OG Titas and Lola simultaneously. They ask her if she's like Gaia, earth, fire, wind, and water. She's taking every element in the world and flying it flying around everywhere, saving it against all odds. How does she defy the future, defy gravity, defy space or time? She's launching rockets at NASA like Josephine Santiago Bond. 
they ask her how she is in four places simultaneously like Jesus like Harry Potter's Hermione like Steve Urkel on Family Matters we are teleported somewhere else, always building the future. Our women scientists, our engineers, our artists, our fashionistas, because future babies, daughters, sons will need to make sure the imprint on how it is designed, how it feels, how we experience it to reflect our communities, to never forget our histories, takes into account and keeps in mind our and their humanity. She holds up more than half of this guy all the damn time. She is the modern day Asian American superhero. Whether or not she has a million followers on any social media network, supernatural powers in a Marvel movie or X-Men comic book to control the weather or the sea so it can be easy on our, on our commute or catfight with each other or not catfight with each other. Whether or not she has written in an Asian American studies or American history book, she is that Asian American superhero with invisible superpowers that the world has always had and needed and will still need just to function. Thank you. And with that being said, I am going to hand back the mic to Jaya. And I do have one quote to leave you all with. Um, I'm going to screen share back from our presentation. It is uh, one struggle, many fronts, which was a saying that they had in the 1960s to talk about um, building solidarity across movements. You know, while we work in tech, it's also about, you know, us not working in a si silo. You know, tech is connected to pretty much every industry and that's made up of people and communities, not just corporations. And it's really important to think that we are working on many different facets, um, organizing. And with that being said, I'm gonna hand the mic to Jaya. Jaya, did you wanna turn your video on? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Erin. That was an incredible poem to follow, but I will, I will try my best. Um, hello, mga kaibigan, magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Hello, my friends. Good evening to everybody here. Um, first off, my name is Jaya Marie Marianne Simpaco de Paz, but most folks just call me Jaya. I am based on the East Coast in New York. I was born in Manila, Philippines um, and migrated to New York in 2002 and have been here ever since. I am on the ALA leadership team as well as um, a marketer in the expert network industry at a company called Alpha Sites. And I also founded their Asian um, ERG there called Akin. Um, first off, I want to say I'm I'm really thankful to, to Aaron and Faster for having me here. I'm humbled to be sharing this stage with, with Aaron, Jimmy, and Brian. I know that they are all some of the most inspiring and passionate people I've ever met, and I'm endlessly thankful to be learning from you all every single day. Um, and, and so to kick off my 10-ish minutes here, I really want to talk about what Aaron asked us to do in this space. And so while we were preparing, she actually asked us about our work and to talk about why it's important in this current moment. And truthfully, I, I don't have as much to share as Brian and Jimmy. Um, transparently, I have been on this journey um, with, for a little less time than they have. They've been on it for far longer than me. They're also the experts at talking about ALA and all the work we've done. And so in thinking about how I could spend this time, I thought I could maybe spend my time talking about a quick story about how I ended up here, how I realized that solidarity and community and this work is important. And maybe hopefully one or two of you uh, can relate. So I was five in Manila in my green plaid uniform when I climbed up on the same chair that my teacher was standing on and I proudly announced, pupunta na ako sa America, meaning I'm going to America because even at a young age, I knew that America was this, and not to be cliche, this promised land. The kids in my class who had moved became something we marveled at, you know, like Mikey, oh, Mikey moved to America. And so I was six when my mom began to pack everything I knew and loved. She painstakingly got all of the papers through for her, a young nurse, and her family of three kids under 10 to, to migrate to America. And I was seven when I cried in my Lola's arms at Naya, but still excited I would finally get to go to this place that everybody spoke about. I was still seven when I first noticed, though, that America isn't all that I thought it was. See, in the movies, New York was all brick buildings, big, tall skyscrapers and snow. And when I landed, having changed into a long sleeve turtleneck and a jacket over it, it was August. And I don't know how many of you have been to New York in August, but it was hot and humid. And so I turned to my tita and said, are you sure we're in New York? It was also when I was seven that I started school and realized that there was no one really else that looked like me on this small one mile long island that we moved to called City Island. I was seven when I was told I was weird for the way I spoke as I was trying to befriend other girls in the class. And so at seven, I learned that it was different. I was different. Even my young mind could process that it wasn't in a good way. 
And so at seven, I began to try to change. I remember burying my mother language, immersing myself in whatever I thought would bring acceptance. It was at eight though that I remember crying on my pillow, using up one of my parents' calling cards. I called my Lola, all because truthfully I missed home and I missed not feeling so different. I was 10 when I moved schools and I met people who are Asian and it was really cool because I didn't feel so bad anymore. I didn't feel as different. And then when I was 11, I began accepting that different was okay that my Asian friends and I ate rice with every meal and spam for breakfast wasn't gross. It was absolutely freaking awesome. I was 11 when I began to deeply connect with people like myself and I understood community for the first time. And then when I was 13, thank you to the age of the internet, I realized that there was a world out there of people who looked like me doing incredible things to be celebrated. So thank you internet and thank you YouTube. So at 13, I began to understand representation and the power that it had. But when I was 16, my cousin who had started university told me about this group of Filipinos at his school. And he was like, they're just trying so hard to be a Filipino and, and proud of it. And even through his dislike, a part of me was curious. I wanted to feel like I belonged. I was 17 when I met my now husband who began to introduce me to all the ways he was involved in the community. And I would be lying to you if I said that it wasn't a little overwhelming. But at 18, I started university and was able to join these clubs. And it was really only then that I grew to be comfortable with the notion of community, the notion of bringing your whole self to every single day. But it was also then that I began to see all of the work that could be done. The country was changing. I began to see that. And try as I did to try to be as involved as possible, I likely could have done more. Anyways, life moved forward, life happened. I found myself starting to work at a new place that promised shiny and new, much like this country when I first migrated. But it was then at 23 that I felt transported back to what seven-year-old Jaya felt like. This new firm was great most of the time but it wasn't without moments of feeling uncomfortable, hearing microaggressions on the desk and on the day-to-day. -day. And I was having trouble processing this and unsure about where to turn. So it was at 23 that I thought I should leave, but it would probably be at the cost of risking me looking back in a few years to say again, I wish I did more. So then I decided to stay and try and make a small difference and to be a change maker. So we began to build a small community, me and those folks at my company who had similar shared experiences and lived experiences. Um, we were trying to build a place where we could just process our thoughts, activate when needed, and just be the young working professionals who we were, who were trying to figure life out in a space that felt safe. And this is something that I've seen so many other ALA leaders try to create with their companies and their workplaces. But around this time, the protests following the murder of George Floyd happened, BLM went global shortly after the COVID pandemic brought with it a steep rise in anti-Asian hate. And in the midst of all that, the tragic death of Angela Quinto happened. It was increasingly clear to me that that feeling that I had as a seven-year-old living through an America that completely differed from what it's supposed to be is something that everyone faces at a much larger scale, that Black folks in our country have been battling for decades, that today we all face, black, face as Black and Brown Americans, as Phil M's, as Asian Americans, as minorities, and that the only way through it is to lean on each other. So back to the original question, when I'm asked why our work is important, why this moment is important, why people like Jell, Jimmy, Brian, Aaron, Faster, and these spaces are important and why building solidarity is important in today's climate and in the face of anti-Asian violence, it's because of something that I started to realize at 11. Community is at the core. Making sure that everyone feels safe and empowered and uplifted is at the center. That as we're all holding the broken promise of America in our hands, allyship, solidarity, community is the promise that we can fulfill for each other. We're the ones who mobilize. We're the ones who spread the word. We're the ones who heed the call. And be it a warrior call when one of our own are being attacked or a call of comfort on the days when we just can't process anything anymore. It's us who have to stand up for each other. It's us who have each other's backs. It's us who make each other feel safe. And maybe one day, the next seven-year-old who steps off the planet JFK feels a little lost or that they're facing hate or that they're different can find immediate comfort in our community. They can find defenders and strength from community and it's all through our collective power. The little things build up to the big things and as small as making new connections or partnering with a new group or joining a club like a group like ALA or starting an ERG or joining an ERG or attending a conference like this or just sharing your story may seem in the face of everything that's happening, it creates impact. 
And while I'm sure everyone else that's on this call with me today can attest to, it all starts somewhere and it always takes a village. So I'm gonna pass it off to Jimmy now, but before I do that, I wanna say thank you for listening. And I'm really excited to keep moving forward with everybody with y'all as my village. So thanks. Thank you so much, Shea, for your story. I mean, I think your experiences is truly your experience. How, and many others have also felt the same thing. And I think that's what's really important between is that together we're experiencing many of these things and being able to connect to each other, to share the stories, to learn from each other, to continue to be one community and grow our community and work with other communities is very important. Um, a little bit about myself. So I self-identify as um, ethnically Chinese and culturally Vietnamese. My grandparents were from China. My mom was bo born in Vietnam. My mom was a Vietnamese refugee to the U.S. and I was born here in the U.S. So in my mind, even though my blood is Chinese, I see myself as Vietnamese. I follow Vietnamese culture, beliefs, et cetera, all across the board. And a lot of these things, the, the identity is very important to us because it is who we are and what connects us to ourselves, but also to others. So for me, my story is I've gone through all this. I went working in the companies and I actually was trying to find a place where I could connect to people. Um, I work at Salesforce as a day job as a lead software engineer. And I really didn't, I saw people that kind of looked like me but there wasn't really a community for us to connect and talk and interact with each other. And so what happened is me and a few peers decided to create that community. We created the Asian um, a, uh, API community at Salesforce, the ERG there called Asia Pack Force. And we did events, we did things, we did celebrations, we um, worked with some, uh, we partnered with some of our um, South, uh, South Asian colleagues to do sponsored Diwali and numerous other things, but we did a lot of struggle getting corporate to getting corporate to help um, help us to sponsor us to do things. Trying to get other parts of our community to come together was a little bit difficult, and we learned things. And this is a lot of ERGs kind of do this in silo. They they figure out how do we host an event, how do we do impact, how do we be inclusive. There is nobody in the company, or we don't get taught doing this as we went up. And so a lot of ERGs, it's a lot of trial and error. You come in, you try something. If it works, it works. And the big thing is that we will make mistakes. Sometimes we're not as inclusive as we should be. Sometimes we don't even remember some of these things. Sometimes we're busy with life. Um, but we were lucky enough to have a community where we could be together and we intentionally tried to be more inclusive. As um, Asia Pack Force got bigger, we, I started meeting other ERG leads from companies. And that came out because me talking at a, a conference about how do you do metrics and ROI for ERGs. And a lot of these ERG leaders from other companies from Dropbox, Google, EA, et cetera, the many, many different companies kept on asking, hey, how, do you, how did you do this? How do you do that? We wanna meet you. And for me, I was kind of the flip side. It's like, I wanna meet you. What you sounds like you've done amazing things and I wanna learn from you. Um, just because someone's on the panel doesn't mean they, they, they've learned everything. There's always an opportunity. And so what ended up happening is a lot of us wanted to talk and it was more of a collaboration, a community for us. And that's what actually how ALA started. We started off as a, a group of DEI leaders, um, ERG leads that wanted to learn from each other. And we were from different API ERGs and different other organizations trying to learn and create a community. And we ended up creating an amazing community where on Slack, we're communicating and talking and doing all these things together, but also teaching each other and collaborating each other. Um, and it's extremely amazing to see people to do that, but also to kind of help each other out, being um, helping each other learn how to be a little bit more inclusive or making sure that we are making sure that we acknowledge what is happening to our allies and those around us, um, such as what's happened with George Floyd and the shooting and the Atlanta shooting, we needed each other to kind of lean, to ask for help, to help teach each other that. And that's what created ALA. Um, so we're not sharing the screen, I don't think, but um, to kind of tell you a little bit about ALA as a big thing is ALA right now, it's been around for about three years. Um, I'm one of the co-founders. We have a few others that were here since the beginning, um, but we are 
over 250 corporate API ERGs, um, which essentially means we have over 250 companies involved. And our mission is to equip and empower Asian Pacific Islanders and their allies to develop as leaders in the workplace and in the communities to advocate, serve and drive collective impact through ERGs and partner organizations. That, that's where we're trying to make sure that we, ERGs are not just a place for us to celebrate. We should celebrate and we should acknowledge our differences and celebrate those differences, but we should also collaborate to make a positive change. Um, to make our community and other communities be uplifted. The vision that we had in order to do this is to, we exist to unify, advance and elevate all APIs in the community and the workplace through ERG advocacy and action. And one thing I wanted to highlight there is all APIs. Um, Asians is a very, very big term that actually has many, many communities together. And we have a tendency to generalize and use the Asian word generally, but at ALA, we try to ensure that when we say API, we mean um, East Asians, Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipino, South Asians, all the different ethnicity that falls under the API umbrella because in reality, a lot of us, we're not a monolith. We're underrepresented and maybe our whole category is represented, but not necessarily our unique identities. And it's, so it's really important to have that self-identity. We, as we said earlier, over 250 um, ERG resources in different companies. A lot of them are Fortune 500. So um, that's huge uh, outreach we have. We have so much experience between the over 250 employee resource groups, but then the numbers in terms of leaders is over 1,500 leaders. And our collective knowledge of how we trial and error, learn how to do API um, advocacy, working with different nonprofits, working with each other. We have so much experience on how we interact with each other and to be able to teach each other. But the thing that's also really unique, we are helping the next generation of leaders, ourselves and the younger professionals to challenge what's happening, to challenge the status quo, to share best practice, to do better to learn and try to do things. Our generation has always been known to innovate. And this is one way that we, we help each other to innovate and do more for our community. Um, you can see the history. We've done a lot of things, tons of stuff. And I'm not gonna go all of it because it's not really, the, the, it's, it's just a lot of things there. And there's a lot of importance on how, what the conversations we have right here. And so, with all this stuff and everything that's going on, I kind of want to take it back a little bit and go to the next slide of what is our desired outcome for ALA? But I assume to some level extent, this is what our community as a whole want to do. And the desired outcomes we have at ALA is one, we want to activate the community into action. We, a lot of us are involved, a lot of us help out. Uh, but there is many that don't and many that will stand there and talk about it, but not take action. And I think in order for us to really make change, we all need to be involved in being that change. And so what we try to do as ERG leads, as um, community um, leaders is to help encourage and activate our employees to, and our community to do things. The second thing is to infuse principles of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's not easy to always remember all these things going on. And that's why we have a community here to help each other remember, teach each other and learn about these things. But how can you do that and, and be part of what you do and what your community and your ERG does? The last one, but not least, is develop the next generation of API leaders in both corporate and civic. As we know, if we're not in the right positions It is mucked up. And so it's not just us doing actions, it's us also helping our fellow um, community members to get in, to be leaders, to be educated, to develop as leaders, to get in those places. But, and essentially for them to do that, all of us will level up and it's to help to have representation in many of those places. And as you see the values we have right below, but I also want to take back one step back that 
over the past 18 months or so, 20 months, a lot of things have happened. Death of George Floyd and many other black, our black communities have happened. There's the Atlanta shooting. There's even things about um, what's happened in Canada with the indigenous people, um, youth being buried near schools and stuff. It's kind of a rough time for all of us, but like this is very powerful for us to actually be together and stand for each other. And to understand that even with right now with racism is happening, one thing I want to kind of just remind people because I do know that it's sometimes hard for some of our communities to um, be there for each other, but to remember that self-identity is very important. That's how I identify. However, how I identify may not necessarily be what people see me as. And the, and the, the self-identity is important. We should cherish and celebrate that. But on the outskirts of what racism is, is racism is how people view you. They're not going to ask you what your identity is. They're not going to ask you where you're born. Typically, they're going to do things based on how they view you or how you look. And this is very important to put out, to understand that racism doesn't affect one person. It doesn't affect just one community. Racism affects all communities. And when one community is no longer being racist against, it shifts to another community and then it eventually comes back. And this is where it's really important for us to all together stand up against racism. Not to say that it's only happening to one group or another, but the fact that we need to work together to make sure racism doesn't happen to anybody, regardless of community, self-identity, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna stop right here so Brian Pank can take over but he'll continue forward with the conversation. Thank you very much, everybody. Great, thank you, Jimmy. And thank you, Aaron, for your incredible intro. Uh, Jay and Jimmy, incredible shares. It's a real pleasure and privilege and honor to share a stage with you. And uh, Jell, can't wait to hear your share later on. Hello, everyone, and happy Philam History Month. I'm Brian, my pronouns are he, him, and I work at Electronic Arts as a product director for the FIFA and NHL and UFC franchises. And for those who don't know, EA is an established video game developer, publisher, and interactive entertainment company. I also serve as the uh, board chair for our Global Asian Employee Resource Group named Aspire, and I'm a co-lead for our Indigenous Solidarity Affinity Group. Outside of work, I serve on a few leadership teams for some nonprofits uh, and community orgs, including ALA, of course, uh, with Jay and Jimmy here. I am ethnically and culturally Chinese, and I reside in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, which is uh, commonly known as Vancouver, Canada. And I just want to thank FasterCon, uh, the entire team here, and of course, Aaron, for bringing this event to life and for inviting me to share. And also thank you to the audience for listening to us and engaging with us today. Um, now, before I get into my, my piece here, I uh, just wanted to touch on something that Erin already held space for, but let's continue to honor and commemorate Angelo Quinto, an aspiring game designer. And uh, that is a field that is very close to, to my role as a product director in games. And uh, for those who don't know, Angelo is tragically uh, lost by asphyxiation by police force. And in addition to Angelo, let's also uh, honor Eric Nicholas, husband of Faster's board member, Charity Nicholas. Uh, Eric suddenly passed away two weeks ago. So deep condolences to the Quinto and Nicholas families. We hope to hear from Charity later today. So uh, for my piece, I'll be touching on the importance of community allyship and solidarity across minority and underserved communities, uh, be it Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, or other ethnic, uh, neurodiverse, abled veteran and LGBTQIA2S plus communities and uh, tie together what Jay and Jimmy just shared. So as I mentioned earlier, I am not Philippine X, nor am I American. Uh, like Jaya, I'm an immigrant. I was originally born and raised in Hong Kong. Then I immigrated to what is commonly known as Canada. And I was conscious about not taking up a seat from a well-deserving Phil Am, but uh, Aaron convinced me to join and talk about allyship. And we know that the various groups which are typically grouped into the monolithic term Asian Americans and along with other marginalized groups are historically quite divided and uh, do not share much common ground. 
but there is one commonality among all of us. And we are all victims of microaggressions, systemic discrimination, um, biases in the workplace and the community, and also a rising tide of macroaggressions and xenophobia and physical violence, which you all heard about this from Aaron and Jimmy and, and Jaya earlier. Um, so I mentioned earlier as well, I founded and serve as board chair for EA's Global Asian ERG. Um, we started this ERG in 2018. And prior to that, I helped as a Vancouver chapter lead for our women's ERG. And uh, I began my community activism about a year and a half ago. And through working through working in the diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging space for a number of years now, uh, while working together with so many uh, other underserved ERG and community leaders, it is clear that while we've made a lot of progress uh, within North America towards equity, there's still a lot of work to do. And there is more awareness in our marginalized communities about the systems of power uh, that were designed to oppress minorities and also in some cases to pit us against one another to fight for slices of a finite pie, uh, what I call scraps. So really this month is, is about honoring the courageous and impactful Filipinx American pioneers who took a stand and drove meaningful change from the Filipino led United Farm Workers Rights and anti-martial law programs, the great civic leaders and celebrities who inspire many others and shape the trajectory of Philams and all Asian Americans. And also the number, the numerous brave uh, healthcare frontline and essential workers who we've lost this past year while helping others through the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, despite these movements and, and these great acts, uh, we know nothing much has changed for the wider Asian community in North America, right? Despite having built so much of the infrastructure of the nation, uh, stood up many industries and business sectors, um, you know, we are still oppressed. We've been oppressed for centuries, right? Starting with the first Filipinos in the 1500s. Uh, we are still very much oppressed and dehumanized by these systems of, of oppression and power. And we're still victims of discrimination and biases and microaggressions, and violence and xenophobia. And we still have the largest income disparity across all ethnic groups. And we're still vastly underrepresented in leadership positions and C-suite and corporate boards, especially Asian women who, by the way, um, statistically, Asian women attain the highest level of education levels of all ethnicities. And uh, it's, this problem is even more pronounced in the tech sector and STEM fields. So what do we do, right? How can we drive change and sustain change? And uh, this is my opinion, but really the best way to do this is by moving together, right? by combining our movements and our causes to move more strategically, but in unison. So while I've personally been focusing on advocating and advancing Asians and indigenous peoples at EA, uh, developing more and better representation in our games, our products, right, through our stories and art and our content, uh, building healthier player communities and, and things like that. Uh, I did join uh, Asian Leaders Alliance in early March of this year, just a couple of weeks before the Atlanta spa shootings. Um, but once I joined ALA, I was just mind blown at how active our community of ERG leaders were. Uh, there, there was a lot of energy from our communities. Uh, it was very inspiring to me. Uh, it was also very therapeutic and empowering. And I no longer felt that I was driving this type of work within my company uh, and, and through my ERG and with my ERG, of course. Um, but I didn't feel like I was going through grief and, and awakening to my own personal experiences by myself. And, um, and I, I really felt that spirit and vigor in our community and how we showed up for one another. Uh, a lot of the leaders in our, our community, uh, we had intentional and deep focus. Uh, we uplifted each other. We were sharing personal stories, uh, ERG best practices, sharing articles. Uh, we we're even opening up our company events to each other. Um, you know, partnering with other nonprofits and other community organizations. Uh, there was even a group building content calendars for Heritage Month. Um, and many of us, including uh, Jaya, Aaron, and Jimmy, have organized uh, a few marquee community events. And we've also developed key partnerships with other organizations, including Faster. Now, I didn't feel that I was alone in that 
I didn't know how to process the xenophobia or incidents of racism, and microaggressions and all that. Um, and uh, not, you know, I, in my, uh, throughout my career, I should say, uh, I did not see many other Asian leaders around me at, at the senior levels or even within the talent escalators. And, uh, you know, personally, I was dealing with a lot of cultural biases and, uh, but I really felt as part of the ALA community uh, that it isn't just a few of us fighting for these rights and equity, right? I finally saw that in a community, we are much stronger together. So I saw the real power of an active community this year. And at ALA, we've created a set of unifying goals, as Jimmy mentioned, and also desired outcomes for the Asian American community. Uh, and our focus areas, which Jimmy shared as well, uh, but we have other focus areas too, uh, which is to develop how develop our presence within our companies, right? To drive diversity, equity, inclusion at work uh, and throughout our career life cycles, um, through our community as well, in uh, investing and engaging in the community and national and local nonprofits. Uh, we're focusing on our narrative through media, entertainment, social media. Um, we're focusing on our policies through government, education, and others. And uh, we're also looking at our past. We're, we're focusing on our education, our history, and uh, through academia. And you heard Jimmy talk about the collective desired outcomes for our community on the previous slide. I'll go a little bit more in depth here. So the desired outcomes that we've laid out are, uh, in the short term, really stopping hate and violence in our communities. Right? So raising the profile and awareness of anti-Asian racism supporting uh, nonprofits, providing services to, to uplift and, and, uh, and provide support. Um, we are also looking to facilitate reporting in these areas and uh, providing more resources to protect our community members. Um, and the other uh, desired outcomes include activating community into action. Uh, Jimmy touched on a lot of this already, but really it's about building allyship and solidarity programs, um, presenting data, um, representation in media, building our Marcom kits uh, for other groups to use, and um, also encouraging more voting. Uh, another desired outcome for us is JEDI, uh, which is- Brian, Do you want to screen share briefly? Sorry, because- No, I no, go ahead. Share. Yeah, please. Thank you. Do you want to actually do it on yours? Because I think- Oh, you want me to? Yeah, for whatever reason, it doesn't show when I, I do it. Do you want to actually just- Yeah, uh, just give me one sec here. I don't have the link to the slides handy. Uh, do you mind dropping a link in the chat here and I'll pull it up. Sorry about that. Let me just refresh because uh, I think for whatever reason, I only had two of your slides on here um, and everyone's saying, hey, your slides aren't showing. So we want to make sure that it does. Uh, it was more the only one that I had was your um, your video, which is why I was like, which, I don't know which thing you were reading off of. Do you just want to screen share what you have, Brian? Actually, I'm not, I don't have a slide for this. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's why, my bad. Okay, go. All continue. good, all good. Yeah, continue carrying on, yeah. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, and then we'll play the video. Um, but in terms of desired outcomes, uh, I mentioned JEDI. So JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. I know Jell will talk about that in, in LEAD as well. Um, and the final desired outcome for us is developing leaders uh, in the corporate space, nonprofit and public sectors, uh, public service, uh, I should say, in all sectors. And, um, and you're probably thinking now that is a lot, right? <laughs> and yes, it is a lot. And we know that no singular org can accomplish all of those things on their own. Um, but we, we have hundreds of orgs in uh, the Americas all looking to do this type of work. A lot of orgs are trying, but not necessarily always moving together. Right? We've even seen some orgs competing with each other, you know, scheduling things like national conventions and speaker panels or marketing campaigns, which overlap. Um, and at the end of the day, that just shards our communities and causes fatigue. So what we're out here to do within ALA is to really help amplify causes and encourage the convergence of efforts and energy across our communities. We will push and drive the solidarity, which is needed uh, to sustain change. And we know that by joining movements and closing our fingers to make that fist, and uh, you know, fist is much stronger than a collection of fingers, we can be stronger together than we could ever be on our own. 
and we can uh, work closer together to overhaul and dismantle these existing systems of oppression and marginalization. Uh, but it really starts with us educating ourselves, looking in the mirrors, right? teaching our loved ones, look around, love each other, uh, see each other, and ask every day, how can I make a change? So um, by the end of FasterCon, we hope that you all leave this um, ready to take action. Right? And those actions will require a lot of acts of love and allyship from each of us to all of us. But you know, when we do come together, uh, it's going to be great, right? And it's, it's really about all of us versus hate. Um, and that's the way we need to look at it. So um, it's going to be hard too, but we do have our incredible uh, communities here at Faster and ALA. Uh, so lean on us um, as we progress on these journeys uh, towards our movements. Um, and you know, we didn't have a lot of community orgs when, when I was younger. <laughs> so in joining these orgs or, or joining or starting these movements have never been more accessible than they are today. So now let's move forward together. Um, I have a couple more things. So I want to leave you all with a few calls to action. If you haven't already, join faster and join LA. Um, after that, please do connect with each other, build out your networks. And after making those initial connections, uh, continue reaching out to each other. Share your stories, develop your skills, support each other. And for any of you here who are elevating in your lives and your careers, you know, if you're a mid-career senior leader, executive, or board director, uh, remember to keep lifting while you climb. And uh, let's keep sharing the stories of Philam excellence and all Asian American excellence. Let's celebrate the pioneers and the game changers, right? Let's celebrate and uplift our arts and entertainment, including gamers and creators, right? Let's share our joy and keep pushing and advocating for our full representation in STEAM, in our education systems as well, and institutes. And, uh, and let's all be community leaders, right? Um, and everyone, keep being awesome, keep inspiring others, and uh, stay inspired yourselves. Okay, Aaron, um, would you like to bring the slides back up and play that video? while you're doing that. Um, so Aaron asked me to include a cool video from one of our, our EA games. This is from NBA Live. Um, the story is one of our producers for that game is, uh, his name is Ryan Santos. He's a, a Filipino American and he pushed to include the tenement court uh, in our game. So here's just a short video which showcases the court in engine. If you have it up. Can folks see my screen? Sorry, I, I think I had like two of them open <laughs> for whatever reason. It's a little bit funky. Can folks just we see our up? we see our notes app right now? Oh, see, y'all see my all my code. <laughs> Apologies. Hold on one second, y'all, because uh, I think Zoom does not like me, and it's whenever I split screen, it will not do this. Sorry. Hold on one quick second, y'all. Technical difficulties. This is why I try to use just one deck for everything. And this still happens with Zoom because it's kind of funky. Um, let me make sure. Can folks see my screen again with the slides? Yep, yep. That's okay. good to me. Great. And I'm going to hit play. Here we go. <laughs> So this was um, designed and implemented in our game about three years ago. Yeah, that's good, Aaron. Thank you so much. So I, I will save the topic and importance of in-game representation and, and uh, media representation for another talk. Um, but that is it for me. Uh, Silamat, everyone, and over uh, to you, Aaron. Thank you so much, Brian, Jaya, and Jimmy. Again, um, please join Asian Leaders Alliance, ALA, uh, and Faster Pros, our professional development component. The links are in the chat and on our Facebook live stream. Um, now, I am very privileged to introduce this other Filipino sister, uh, Dr. Jell Cortez.
who is the founder and executive director of our community partner, Lead Filipino. Um, Jill? Short and sweet, just the way I like it. Um, happy fam, everyone, and good evening. Go Giants. If I have any anger or angst toward me because of this hat, that's exactly why I wore it. So I know that the only thing standing between all of us and the game this evening is really stepping into a very critical and a crucial and a timely conversation. So first want to give shout outs and love to Faster and the other speakers um, this evening. It is such an honor to spend some quality time with you all to, to really talk about this issue of advocacy and really actualizing that into bite-sized steps in terms of what that means for your own advocacy and what it means to be an activist versus an advocate versus an educator versus a steward of all of these different processes. So again, thank you to the FASTER team and Aaron especially for inviting Lead Filipino uh, to join in this evening. I am coming to you kind of talking about two different things. I will share about Lead Filipino, an organization that I founded back in 2015. And then because Lead Filipino is truly uh, a labor of love and it, we just became a nonprofit, but within that process, as you all know, um, in terms of the grit and the hustle, it's not paying the bills yet. So I have a whole full-time job and it was very heartening to hear how this group is, is paying attention and going inward to talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and really defining what that means based on a corporate setting or in a public agency. And for my day job, as you can see, I inserted it there in mismatched text. I work for one of the largest nonprofit mental and behavioral health agencies in California. And I am their first vice president of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. There is no singular playbook on what racial equity and DEI looks like for an org, although there are promising practices and evidence-based practices that we can get into uh, at a later point, although I know that my time is limited. So I'm gonna hit a lot of my points, everyone, in very broad strokes. Um, I was also remiss in mentioning that I am joining you all from Moekma Ohlone land from Eastside San Jose, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. But to start this conversation, I want to, to just tell you a little bit about Lead Filipino, everyone. We are a nonprofit, that's new. We just became a nonprofit in May of this year. And for folks like Aaron that are familiar with Lead Filipino's story, and knows that we operate out of a, a what I call a sophisticated uh, syndicated um, network of the trunks of our cars. I rarely offer people rides in my car because I have clipboards, megaphones, microphones, name tags, t-shirts from 2019. If anyone wants a Fly P Nice 2019 t-shirt, I have a whole bunch of them in my car. But nonetheless, we are still as grassroots as they come. We are set to get office space in the next six months. So come visit us in downtown San Jose. We will have office space over at Creativity's um, so, sort of art and cultural hub that they are creating for small organizations, just like ourselves. We work specifically within civic engagement, everyone. And what that means is through grassroots leadership and building the capacity of Phil Ams and, and everyone else that is down and supportive of our mission, that we invest in our collective relational leadership building through, a, through grassroots understanding and grassroots environments. And what does that mean? It, it goes back to what I said earlier, we work out of the trunks of our cars. We are at the Jollibee's planning community meetings. We are at Panera Bread till the late evening hours, till they kick us out. And of course that's all pre-pandemic planning, but all through and in the name of direct action. So you'll see our work very pronounced in the realms of uh, voting rights. We have a partnership with the County of Santa Clara where we are based. Um, and we used to be pre-pandemic at the monthly naturalization ceremonies uh, to register voters, to educate them. So really being stewards of our basic civil rights 
access to voting, increased participation. We have produced voter guides in both English and Tagalog. Um, we would love to, to produce um, voter guides in a, in a wide array of uh, Filipino languages, but, but right now, as I said, we're small and mighty. So if that appeals to you, we'd love to talk with you more. But I wanna be careful and also say that our voter guides and our issue-based work is not for any candidate. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. And because of that, we do not endorse in any candidate or political elections. However, when it comes to the issues, when it comes to voting rights, when it comes to sharing knowledge, if it's about animal welfare, if it's about, for us, issues that advance racial equity and social justice, then we can, as a C3, invite folks in and engage our members and our families and our students in these larger conversations. And so in addition to our civic engagement work, I mentioned our education and our grassroots leadership initiatives. You'll see that through our summer program that we just finished. It is a 10 week combination Phil Am studies and civic engagement course where because of the pandemic, we brought this program to a national audience through Zoom. And in this 10 week course, we cover everything, starting with our identity, really rooted and grounded in the principles of ethnic studies. So who, who am I? What is my family story? And what is the positive social change that I can bring to my community based on my bandwidth and based on what that looks like for me? So we run a 10 week program called Awareness in Action. Again, it's a Philam Studies civic engagement course. In those sessions, we tackle everything and look at identity, mental health and wellness. We look at uh, cultural preservation, history, advocacy. So within that, our main issues that we educate our students and our families on are really concerned with, with civil rights, um, ethnic studies. We were a part of the statewide California-based proposition campaign, which uh, focused on affirmative action to remove our state's ban on affirmative, on affirmative action. We have worked around tenant protections and again on voter rights. And I'm gonna talk a lot about um, our Justice for Angelo Quinto work, but short and sweet everyone, we operate year round and we have programs and services that really aim to not just activate, but to enrich and to amplify all the greatness and all the excellence that is the Philam community. So you'll see that through our annual Fly Penis Leadership Summit. Last summer, we launched our queer, our queer Philippinex Lakbay Summit. And we have a bunch of other initiatives like our Lola Scholarship Fund that was led by one of our organizers and really just aim to be a space, a resource and whatever you want us to be for you. And the reason I say that is from time to time, we get folks trying to put labels on us. So what are you, Lead Filipino? Are you like this group that's like for happy hour? Are you this and this and this? And I just tell folks, we are what you want us to be. So long as it fits with our values around the, the being a steward, being an org that stewards social justice. So representation, visibility, fairness, access, giving a voice to those that are not at those tables that are disenfranchised. If you are about all those things, then come on through. But I won't lie, we have had people, you know, very well, well-meaning um, community members try to donate pianos to us. And, you know, right now we don't have that office space yet, but, but we're nestled right in San Jose and it really warms our hearts. And it's the ultimate, ultimate reward to know that our, our being and our presence is welcome. And people see um, there is a need that we are truly serving within civic engagement and building our leadership in these spaces. We've talked a lot about um, this evening, and I think it is awesome that FASTER curated this multi-day conference to really start the conversation around advocacy because the work that you all are doing in innovation and technological advancement and informatics and you name it, things that I just, you know, will only see on the other side when I am enjoying the product and it is revolutionizing my life. I give my hats off to all of you. When we think about the, the connective tissue that is advocacy and how that 
is linked to legislation and public policy. We can look in modern history and say that the changes that we see in diversity and representation and visibility would not have happened without legislative influence. And, and so lending credence to that through Lead Filipino, our work within civic engagement really tries to bring that to the community in a way that is not overwhelming and in a way that is not intimidating because we are well aware, keenly aware that these systems are often esoteric. They're overly scholarly. They're very mazy and they're like a labyrinth. And we know that in our communities, whether or not it's Bill Am, AAPI, we were not, at least for me and the folks of Lead Filipino through and through, we were not bred to talk about politics at the dinner table. Heck, we weren't bred to, to voice an opinion that was contrary to whoever the authority was in the house. So then you, you intersperse and you mix in politics with money, with power, with financial literacy, with who's at that table, who's being excluded, who's being uplifted, who's being punished, and then it gets real wily, everyone. But I do want to talk about Angelo Quinto. For the past eight months, Lead Filipino has been involved with the Justice for Angelo Quinto, Justice for All Coalition, everyone. And in this work, we have developed a deep relationship with the family of Angelo Quinto. Tita Cassandra, his mother, Bella, his sister, uh, Andre, his brother, uh, and his dad, Tito Robert, and auntie, um, Tita Diane. And in this work, I know that many of you, it seems like are familiar with Angelo's story. For those that are not, Angelo was a young uh, Filipino-American Navy veteran, 30 years old, that on a night a few days before Christmas on December 23rd, 2020 to be exact, was experiencing a mental health crisis. It was not a finer moment in his life and definitely a time where he needed resources and services and de-escalation. And so his sister being fearful for him called the only number that's available to us when we are in a state of emergency, which is 911. Right now, when you call 911, you can get a, you get a cop car, you get an ambulance and you get a fire truck. What else can we get when we call 911 is the question that Lead Filipino is asking. So the officers show up and they apprehend Angelo um, without asking any questions. And we believe the family through and through, no matter how the media wants to portray or convolute or defame their character, Angelo was calm. He had no, he was unarmed and he was in his PJs and they proceeded to pretzel him up and and put him in a knee to neck hold. And why a knee to neck hold everyone was not banned in a post, post George Floyd era is beyond me. And we are without words at that reality. So they held him for close to six minutes. We have deep reason to believe that Angelo um, had already lost his life when the paramedics came and took him to the hospital. Given social distancing measures, Angelo passed away three days later in the hospital. His family received no answers and it took seven, six and a half months for them to get the official autopsy reports at the, uh, in, um, at the coroner's. Um, I think the term is basically the coroner in the county that he died in um, did a whole ceremony where the family could not speak against and had to just listen in a one-way fashion. But this work, really galvanized. And one thing that was through and through and so real for our community was seeing hundreds, I'm telling you hundreds of community members dialing in when we started organizing on a local level in the city of Antioch where Angelo was murdered. And those four officers, the two that watched, the two that held him, the one that put his neck, his knee on his neck, when we were demanding that they be removed immediately and placed on leave. So if you're placing them on leave and you're asking for their immediate termination, those are two different processes. So starting a petition that amassed over 25,000 signatures, showing up to these Antioch city council meetings virtually and having immediate demands that a mental health crisis response team be, be uh, instated into the 
police budget in Antioch, putting body cams on these officers and denouncing and demanding that these officers be removed. One thing that was true through and through in this moment and when we were organizing the testimony and the comments from the public, from DC, from New York, from all parts of California, from Washington state, from Texas, was this resounding hymn. And I wrote about this on an Instagram post as I reflected the resounding hymn from, from all gender identities. I saw myself in Angelo. I saw my brother in Angelo. I saw my partner in Angelo. I saw my cousin in Angelo. I see my son in Angelo and calling for these reforms and seeing that this issue around how we address police violence in a system that we did not create. And I'm talking to broader API, Philam, a system that we've inherited that we find ourselves transfixed in and interacting with. Hearing people call in and seeing that support which would then set a fire for about a six and a half to seven month journey, everyone. Um, that looked very local when we were testifying in Antioch, but then also brought in the opportunity to pass statewide legislation. And I'm happy to share in my few minutes here that Assembly Bill 490, the Justice for Angelo Quinto Act uh, was signed into law by the governor on September 30th, um, so just last month. Angelo's law, everyone, effective January 2022 in California, will ban knee to neck holds in the state. Not only will it ban knee to neck holds, but if a law enforcement officer so chooses to use a knee to neck hold or any type of positional asphyxia, he, he, she, they will be subject to criminal charges in an investigation. Because we know that as we try to remove the militaristic tactics and the traits and the characteristics of our police force, that there are many options to de-escalate a situation than to literally block someone's uh, ability to breathe. And so as we think about our, our journey together the next couple of days, this, this question of what steps can we take? And in Lead Filipino, we learned, we learned a ton being involved in this campaign being up in these late nights, helping to coordinate letters and following the legislative process at every committee, coordinating uh, testa, uh, testimonies and, and comments. And just, we don't have all the answers either, everyone. But the point of an org like Lead Filipino is to make this process bearable. When the families like Angelo, I mean, when families like Angelo's cannot muster to be there, so coming together as a community, we, every speaker before me has used the same vocabulary around activating our communities, making it safe, spaces of belonging. When we talk about racial equity and you ask, what can I do? What can I do during this time? You can come to the meetings. You can share the posts that you see on our social media. You can have conversations, especially in your employee resource groups. This issue of police accountability in the larger API community, let's not lie, is a third rail. People do not want to touch it the same way they don't want to touch affirmative action in API communities. So if this speaks to you in any way, we need your voice. We need you to steward this work with us. And through orgs like, like Lead Filipino, we endeavor to make this process um, social, safe and educational because none of us went to school to be activists or to be advocates. And so bearing that in mind in these public systems, we need to create it in a way where we see ourselves in these movements. And so I'll end on that note. Thank you everyone again for the quality time. Please do stay in touch with Lead Filipino. We're based out of San Jose. And we are putting on a fan jam festival to end this on a, on a bouncy note. We are putting on a music festival, performances, food, rhythm, everything in between. So thank you again. And I'll pass it back to Aaron. Thank you.
Jill, Dr. Jill Cortez of Lead Filipino, amazing work that you've been doing on so many different fronts and campaigns. Um, we're a proud community partner of Lead. Um, please, please, please uh, support Lead Filipino and all of their amazing work. Um, our national board secretary, uh, Charity, is actually unable to make it tonight. Um, as many of you know, uh, Charity Nicholas, her husband, Eric, recently passed. She just flew in um, from Hawaii and is like stuck in traffic. Uh, I did tell her I was going to take over for her. So I'm only going to um, give you all uh, a brief two notes. Um, can folks see my screen? You want to shout it out? My fellow panelists, you want to tell me if you can see this? I know that Zoom hates me <laughs> a lot of the different days. Your desktop your desktop, Aaron. Hey, other desktop. Oh my goodness. Why does this happen? Hold on one second, y'all. Um, I only have one or two more slides up and then we can end today, but I do want to make sure that folks see this because, um, and I actually have an article as well that I will drop uh, into the chat. This um, is actually a part of um, Charity's life that's really important. And for most folks that don't know Charity, um, she dedicated her um, life's work really to uh, public health and safety. And it was inspired by her roommate at Cal, um, UC Berkeley, which is our shared uh, alma mater. And with that being said, I'm going to share my screen if y'all can take a look at this. This is Grace um, Ascension, who is a roommate of Charity, our, our beautiful uh, Faster National Board Secretary and also previously the uh, past president of UC Berkeley or Cal Filipino American Alumni Chapter. Uh, when I joined um, the chapter, it wasn't very active. We would celebrate homecoming about once a year. And when Charity took on the position, she created mentorship programs um, and really extended out um, a lot of commemorations towards her friend Grace, uh, who was her roommate uh, on campus. So for folks that don't know Grace's story, I encourage you to read about it. Uh, Grace Ascension was an undergraduate at Cal. Um, she was violently killed. She was stabbed. I don't even remember the number when she was telling myself and Jal about over 30 times um, on campus. Uh, I remember Charity telling us that, and this is in the 1990s, they didn't have cell phones yet and they had phone trees. And so to walk to class because the idea of being a target of someone could murder you was about the same exact body type as mine and Jal's, which is, you know, you're about five-ish feet, uh, maybe light to semi brown skin if I talk about colorism and how we think about all of these different hate crimes and long black hair and every um, one of the different members of I, I think it was PAA Philippine American Alliance they would have to have a kuya walk them to class you know because people were really scared on campus of you know their um, health and safety um, she was murdered in one of the buildings in which our undergraduate student group uh, resided uh, Charity was one of the last people to see her and, you know, up until, I guess, a couple of years ago, they finally found um, Grace's killer and, you know, he was white, but this was not classified as a hate crime. In fact, the police, from what Charity had said to me, um, they had said that it was, they thought it was coming from the Filipino American community, which is actually, you know, not uh, the case and very unfortunate. So uh, I encourage you all, you know, I, I hate to end on a sad note, you know, in terms of empowerment, I, I like to think that charity's work and health tech and safety, like I said, again, whether she's thinking about the reopening when, whenever something happens, I know when the YouTube shooting happened a few years ago, you know, charity was the first person that ABS CBN called um, to comment on that issue. Um, as we think about I know a lot of these different issues, not only uh, Angela Kinto, you know, that's that's very much connected when we think about police brutality and, and George Floyd, you know, that those are not isolated incidents. Being Filipino American, whether you're someone as light skinned as me that you can pass for East Asian, you know, and there are hate crimes happening to a lot of us that pass for that. I'm, I'm 60 Chinese and 8 Spanish. I am Kapapangan and you know, Tagalog, but, you know, I actually was also a victim of a hate crime this past year during the pandemic. I, I don't talk about it a lot because I don't think I, I fully understood what happened, but when it, I would say that there were, there were glass shards I found um, of my car the same time that my friend's windows were being broken into their homes in Petaluma and they had Chinese writing on their walls. Um, that was the same time that um, our businesses, whether they were boba shops and Lee sandwiches in San Jose and Milpitas, were also defaced. Um, you know, these issues are not 
something that, you know, happened again, isolated or one or two times and then we organize and then everything's fine. You know, these things are historic. They are systemic. There are, there exists institutional racism. And within FASTER, you know, again, we are a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit. But when it comes to basic social issues of justice, this is something that you know, is very important to take um, attention to. You know, and so I would call on any of the FASTER pros, ERGs, if you are a part of a tech company employee resource group, uh, please join us and Asian Leaders Alliance, ALA. Uh, get informed about various issues and campaigns. Lead Filipino is one of our, our great community partners that does so much education on an array of issues uh, and inform you know, your workplaces and your families because we're all affected by, you know, whether it's anti-Asian violence in all many different flavors that it looks like, whether you're a light-skinned, a dark-skinned Filipino, uh, whatever that is, whether you are, are not Filipino American, you're Asian American um, or from another community of color, or an ally that doesn't, you know, identify as a person of color, or you're someone that may be, you know, gender queer uh, or trans. You know, a lot of hate crimes are happening that uh, happens at the intersections of our identities, being Filipino Americans. And so, you know, this year, what's very different about FasterCon was to make this front and center. Uh, most years, we talk about, you know, getting jobs as engineers or founding companies. And, and while like we couldn't fit everything into the program this year for entrepreneurship, I thought it was really important to highlight this uh, and this moment in time uh, to keep things very relevant. Um, next year, we'll be restructuring our organization a lot. We've received a lot of feedback um, from you all as members and even our leadership who are, you know, many of them are still standing um, despite layoffs at companies like Airbnb, despite, you know, a lot of folks losing work um, and, you know, having to transition work online, uh, we're still here and, you know, we're standing strong. And I want to thank again, um, Dr. Jell Cortez from our community partner, Lead Filipino, and our allies, as well as other friends who are Filipino American within ALA Asian Leaders Alliance. We encourage you to join both of these organizations along with FASTER and continue to get involved. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. And tomorrow we will begin FasterCon Day 2, kicking off with our creative showcase at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and day three will be uh, life sciences uh, into the early afternoon. And with that being said, thank you, Faster. Um, happy fam, and have a good rest of your night. Take care.